Welcome to Archeo Ed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americans. You know, the ones that American history books never talk about. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all over the planet for over 30 years now. In this podcast, I'll share what I've learned. Sometimes it'll be stories of my adventures. Other times, it'll be things I've learned along the way. It'll be whatever I feel like talking about because this is my podcast, Beholden to No One. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Season 5, Episode 1, Ed's Origin Story at Copan. Hello, everyone. After a crazy summer of travel and moving to Colorado... I'm back and ready to keep podcasting. And I've upgraded my studio from my closet in Texas to my basement in Colorado. For this first episode, I thought I'd address one of the most common questions I get. How did I become an archaeologist? The answer is at a field school in Copan, Honduras, when I was just 20 years old. The year was 1990, and I spent a month in Copan learning from and excavating with some of the most amazing people. I was extremely lucky to be there while some incredible discoveries were made. The events I witnessed and participated in changed my life and began my career as an archaeologist. But before I can relate those, I have to start at the beginning. Even before I left high school in Dallas, Texas, I knew I wanted to be an explorer. I had studied the Inca and dreamed of finding another Machu Picchu. I chose CU Boulder for college, not because of its programs, but for its proximity to the ski slopes. I was a typical kid, more interested in having fun than studying. My assumption was that I'd take Inca classes at CU. But as it turned out, there were no Incan scholars at Boulder. I took my core classes first, and when it came to pick some electives, I found a course on Maya civilization. To be honest, I had never heard of the Maya. But the course sounded interesting, and it was about a pre-Columbian civilization south of the border, so what the heck? The professor was Payson Sheets. He taught with passion, and his stories of his excavations at Seren in El Salvador were exciting. About halfway through the semester, he told the class about a field school in Copan, Honduras that next summer. Again, 1990 was the year. His friend and colleague Bill Fash from Northern Illinois University was leading it and would accept only 12 students. First come, first serve. I took the application form home and filled it out that very evening. The next morning, I sent it and a check for my last $100 off to Illinois. A few weeks later, to my delight, I received an acceptance letter. I was in. I called my dad and told him. He said, You're an idiot. You've never even been out of the country. Honduras? And what have I told you about committing yourself to things you can't afford? He was right, as usual. I barely knew where Honduras was, and I was flat broke. But, being the stubborn ass I still am today, I did it anyway. I got a job in Sewell Hall's dormitory cafeteria as a dishwasher and made a whopping $1,200 I needed to pay for the field school. Summer came and I took a flight from Dallas to San Pedro Sula to meet Fash and the other students. We loaded up on a bus and headed for Copan. Real quick, just to orient you, Copan is an ancient Maya city located in Honduras a few miles east of the Guatemalan border. It had a dynasty of 18 kings who ruled roughly 500 years from the 5th to the 9th centuries CE. Due to building with volcanic tuft instead of the usual limestone, The city's monuments remain in great condition. It's an absolute gem of the Maya world. Its elegance and architectural sophistication led Fash to famously say, If Tikal is the New York of the ancient Maya world, Copan is its Paris. 
As we drove the seven hours from San Pedro Sula to Copan, the roads quickly turned to dirt and got progressively worse as we traveled west. We arrived just as the sun went down, checked into Copan's only hotel at the time, and shared our first dinner together. At dinner, we met Bill's field school teaching partners, his wife Barbara and Honduran archaeologist Ricardo Garcia. The fascist two young sons were also there. It was nice to have some little kid energy in what was otherwise a little anxiety-inducing. We were in remote Honduras. I woke early that first morning and walked the half block to the tiny town's plaza. From there, I could see the beautiful green valley I was in, with mist hanging on the surrounding hills. A farmer on horseback passed by. There were no cars in Copan back in those days. Two adorable little girls in school uniforms came skipping up the street, hand in hand. As a skinny dog crossed their path, one let go of her friend's hand, planted her feet, and viciously kicked the dog in the gut. The dog yelped and ran. The girls giggled, relocked hands, and skipped off. It was my first reminder. I wasn't in Kansas anymore. The first week was filled with classes taught at the hotel, site visits, and tours of the laboratory. Our hotel was the Marina Copan, the only one in town back then. Today, it's still there, but now it's fancy. Luxury rooms, a pool, and a gourmet restaurant. Bill Fash's tours of the site were awesome. The center of Copan is a massive acropolis, built up over a hundred feet from the valley floor. As with most Maya cities, the temples were built like Russian dolls. Older, smaller ones nested inside subsequent constructions. But at Copan, the temples eventually became one huge acropolis that interconnected them all. Normally, it's hard to dig between the phases. The rubble collapses in dangerous ways and prevents deep excavations without stripping entire layers off. That was not the case at Copan. Its builders used a brown, sticky clay from the riverbed to cover each temple before building a new one over it. As a result, archaeologists can dig tunnels into the Acropolis very deep without shoring them up. The clay does that naturally. Today, there are over five kilometers of archaeological tunnels under Copan's Acropolis, but back then, they were just getting started. Bill brought us into the tunnels they had dug under the hieroglyphic stairway. At plaza level, they had found a buried stela and a stone-carved urn, both naming the first and second kings of Copan. At the time... They were thinking that it was the tomb of the lineage founder, Yash Kuk Mo. But four years later, when I returned to Copan as a staff archaeologist, we found the actual tomb deep under Temple 16. And as I like to say, that's a story for another podcast. Also under the hieroglyphic stairway, but higher up, Bill showed us the amazing tomb of Smoke Emish God K. He was Copan's 12th ruler, and ceramic effigies of him and the 11 rulers before him were placed around his body. The tomb had been featured in the 1989 October edition of National Geographic, so seeing it in person felt like I was meeting an archaeological celebrity. Then it was Ricardo Agurcia's turn to show off his tunnels. Dug into Temple 16, right in front of the famous altar Q, his tunnels led to what's still Copan's most incredible building, Rosalila. Unlike all the other buried temples, Rosalila's superstructure was well-preserved, stucco facades and all. The brown clay preserved all of its colors, reds, blues, greens, yellows, all brilliant as the day they were painted. Faces of the sun god and Kawil were above the central door. Huge images of birds and ancestors emerging from snake mouths covered the walls. Today, a replica of Rosalila stands as the centerpiece of Copan's sculpture museum. But back then, it had just been found, 
and wasn't even fully excavated. I was there while history was literally being made. In the evenings, it didn't take long for the other students and I to find the town's only bar, the Tung Kool. That means sacred drum in Maya. Once I found it, I hung out there drinking beer nearly every night. It was owned by two cool English-speaking guys named Mike and Rene. My Spanish sucked back then, so it was a real blessing that they spoke my language so well. It was there that I met two other Hondurans who became my good friends. One was a character named Jesus Nastra. He went by simply Nasty. Nasty was Ricardo Agurcia's high school buddy who was hanging around the excavations for the summer. He was a real mischievous guy, and Ricardo was clearly frustrated by him. But they were childhood friends, so Ricardo put up with him like an irritating brother. The other guy was about my age, and his name was Chavi Sada. He was brilliant, funny, and another troublemaker. I don't know what it is, but I'm always drawn to people like that. Chavi Sada spoke English, French, and German, and he had learned them all just by listening to tourists in the ruins. He was making a good living being a tour guide and apparently spending most of it at the Tunkul. Those guys taught me to play a fast-paced card game called Kong Kien. If I took too long with my turn, Nasty would say things like, In southern Honduras, you'd be shot for that. And he wasn't kidding. Honduras was a rough place. Case in point, on the first weekend, there was music in the plaza and the whole town was there. It was friendly enough. But then two men got into a machete fight. Sparks flew off the metal as they clashed. No one stopped them until one hacked deeply into the other's shoulder. Then some other men broke it up and dragged the hurt one off. The music never stopped. In my broken Spanish, I asked a woman what it was about. She said it was something about a girl. Okay, I'll take my first commercial break here, and when I return... I'll tell you about Linda Sheely's arrival. Hey folks, it's still me, Ed. One of these days I'll attract some commercial revenue, but until then, I'll just keep plugging my own stuff. I love the ancient Maya calendar. I love to learn about it, and I love to teach about it. As part of my teaching mission, I create an annual wall calendar that correlates the Maya calendar with the Christian Gregorian calendar. It functions just like a normal wall calendar with 12 months and all the Western holidays displayed. But it also tells you what day it is in the ancient Maya calendar, the Solkin, the Hob, and the long count cycles. The photos for each month are beautiful windows into the ruins of the Maya world, taken by the 12 winners of our annual photo contest. The 2024 Mayan calendar is available for purchase now at my website, mayan-calendar.com. That website also contains a lot of interesting information about ancient Maya calendrical cycles. So even if you don't want a wall calendar, you'll probably like the website. Again, mayan-calendar.com. That's mayan with an N, dash symbol, calendar.com. We were told that Linda Sheely was going to teach us about Maya hieroglyphs when she arrived during week two of the field school. I was excited to meet her because I had read her dissertation called Maya Glyphs, the Verbs. I honestly had no understanding of what it said, but while other scholars could barely recognize names and dates in Maya texts, this woman wrote a whole book about hieroglyphic verbs. One morning I was standing out on the street ready to go to the ruins. Breakfast was always toast, coffee, and weird fruits I didn't like. So I was done quickly. Linda Sheely rolled up in a beat-up red pickup truck and called out the window, Any of you students ready to go to the ruins? There were virtually no cars in town, so where she got that truck, I still don't know. But I said, I'm ready. And she said, well, get in then. So I did. 
I introduced myself, and we got going. There was an awkward silence, and I wasn't sure what to say. So I said, doesn't look like it'll rain today. She looked at me out of the side of her eye and said, knock on wood, and hit me in the forehead twice with her fist. This was my first exchange with Linda Sheely, and she called my head wood and hit me. It was very off-putting. Little did I know then that I'd become her grad student and she'd become the best mentor I ever had. We got to the site entrance and she told me to wait there for the other students as she went in. With Fash, we usually went in the back or the side entrances. I had never been to the front tourist entrance. I looked up and there were seven scarlet macaws in the trees. They were the mascots of the site. As I admired them, I felt a tap on my hip. Looking down, there was a spider monkey, standing upright, staring back at me. In a surreal exchange, he reached his hand up to me. I put my hand in his, and he shook it, like a human. Then he walked off into the ruins. I learned later that I had just met Poncho, another mascot of the site. He was raised in captivity and thought he was a human. Some years later, when I returned to the site, Poncho would sit with me at break and share my pack of crackers, eating them bite by bite like a little human. Anyhow, back to Sheely. Once the other students arrived, she gave us a tour of Copan's main plaza. I was astounded. She walked us through the stele, reading the glyphs like she was reading a book. My term paper for Pace and Sheets had been about Maya hieroglyphs, but I had no idea anyone could translate them so well. She also explained all the iconography and the regalia and headdresses of the kings portrayed on the stele. Things that looked like squiggles all of a sudden had meaning and context. Her enthusiasm was infectious, and at the end of the day, it was clear that this big, brash, kind of foul-mouthed woman knew more about Copan than all the rest of the archaeologists put together. She was also just fun. At night, in the hotel, she played cards with the students. She taught us a game called Oh Shit, and reveled in yelling Oh Shit at full volume. Sheely only stayed for a few days, and then she was gone. But even that short time made a big impression on me. More than any other thing that happened to me at Copan, Sheely made me want to be a Mayanist. Week three of the field school, we got to help out in the lab. Some students did ceramics, others helped in the osteology lab, but I volunteered to help Barbara Fash with what was called the Copan Mosaics Project. Barbara had a huge sandbox in the courtyard of the lab building. In it, she put big, heavy pieces of building facade sculptures and tried to put them back together. Most of the pieces came from piles that the archaeologists stacked up from fallen temple walls in the 1890s. Bill called them gawk piles, meaning God only knows. Barbara was in charge of putting the stone mosaics back together. My job was to push stone blocks around in the sand all day. Barbara stood on a ladder above, saying, Move that one there, and no, move that one back. She'd stare at it, see if any of it fit together, and then we'd start the process again. It was exhausting, but fun. It was like the heaviest puzzle I ever worked on. Fun nights at the Tunkul Bar continued. Project visitors and the occasional tourist came in and out. One night, I overheard a conversation between some of the field school students and Justin Kerr. Kerr was becoming famous for inventing the Maya vase rollout technique of photography. He was a former Playboy photographer and a very smooth operator, complete with leather jacket. Two of the students he was talking to were Inga Calvin and Sandy Noble. Inga went on to be a professor at CU Boulder and Sandy became director of FAMSI, Foundation for the Advancement of Mesoamerican Studies. It was Justin Kerr who convinced millionaire Maya ceramic collector Lou Ranieri to fund FAMSI. But on this evening, 
He was explaining how ceramics got smuggled out of the country by people he had personally met. He said they'd have artists make 19 perfect copies and put the real one in a box for shipment like they were all a bunch of souvenirs. The ladies were charmed. I thought he was kind of a blowhard. But in the subsequent years, I learned to appreciate Justin and his contributions to the field. First impressions can be misleading. I also got closer to Chavi Sada. He invited me to go horseback riding with him on the weekend. Renee and Mike said I should be careful trusting Chavi Sada, citing a time when he had cut the face of French archaeologist René Viel with a broken beer bottle. And yeah, he was rough around the edges, but I liked him. We ended up riding horses together a number of times. We rode through the dry riverbed under the Acropolis Cut and all over the valley. He brought me to a weird frog sculpture up in the hills and to some beautiful waterfalls. I got a chance to see the Copan Valley like no one else but Chavisada could have shown me. But he was trouble. When I returned to Copan four years later, Mike said that Chavisada had snuck into the U.S. and was working in California. Then, when I returned some 20 years later, I asked after Chavisada again. This time, my questions were met with looks of fear. Yes, Chavisada was in town, but no, I should not go looking for him. Mike, still the owner of the Tunkul, explained that Chavisada had started some kind of car theft ring in San Pedro Sula using an army of kids to do his dirty work. And then apparently, people got murdered and he returned to Copan to keep a lower profile. I didn't find him then, but I will try again next time I'm in Copan. Probably a bad idea. I know, but he was my friend. Okay, final commercial break. When I return, we'll get to an awesome discovery inside Rosalila. After years of hard work, software engineer Matt Neal and I have created the most sophisticated Maya calendar date conversion calculator ever made. We call it Bars and Dots, and we're giving it away for free. Bars and Dots is the name handed down to us from the man who made the world's first Maya calendar software, Sid Hollander. Sid left us in May of 2022, but his memory lives on through Bars and Dots. This resource is not for the casual learner. If you're new to the Maya calendar, it's guaranteed to make your eyes cross. But for those who really want to know the depths of its sophistication and intricacies, Bars and Dots is for you. Check it out and play with it at BarsandDots.com. That's Bars, A-N-D, Dots, dot com. If you're a math nerd like me, it'll blow your mind. Okay, I'm back from what I'm sure was a compelling commercial break. During week four, we finally got a chance to excavate, but actually most of the students were either sick in bed or opted to continue working in the lab. It was a hot, humid place, not for the faint of heart. Growing up in the Texas heat was an advantage that I had. As it turned out, only my roommate and I were up for excavating. I'm embarrassed to admit that I don't remember his name. If anyone listening does, please remind me. Anyhow, we were assigned to a big flat surface in between two temples on the top of the Acropolis. It was almost dead center of the top of the Acropolis, in between the community council house called the Popol Na and the founder's temple or Temple 16. Whatever it was, it took center stage. Because of that position, Fash thought it might have been a dance platform. Until just that year, it had been covered with what Fash called gawk piles. There was nowhere free to dig. So we were the first to excavate there. I was excited, perhaps too much so. We had some local workers supervising us, as well as the chief of all the workers named Moncho. Mancho was a huge hulking man with a hearty laugh and a kind face. 
He gave me a pickaxe and motioned to the one-by-one -one meter excavation area he had helped us line with string and stakes. Excited to show him what I could do, I swung the pickaxe up over my head and connected hard with the ground, dislodging a big chunk of dirt. I swung the axe up over my head again, but I couldn't pull it down. I looked up and Moncho had caught it in one hand. I let go and he motioned me to step to the side. Then he stepped into the square and very gently scraped the ground with the axe head. Then he handed it back to me to try again. And I was like, oh yeah, right. Artifacts. Gentle. It seems like common sense now, but I knew nothing then. Over the next few days, we carefully dug down about a meter. We found multiple layers of stucco surfacing. The third one was intact enough to see that it was painted. Red, green, and black outlines. Clearly it was part of some larger pattern, but we couldn't understand it from just our one-by-one. Fash was pleased. It reinforced the idea that it was a formal open space. By the way, just below our level was a terrace with mosaic wall sculptures of two dancing jaguars. That's another reason that Fash thought it might be a dance platform. I'll put a picture of those two jaguars in my show notes because they're fun. One afternoon while excavating, Nasty came up to see me. In an excited voice, he said, Come with me. You've got to see what Ricardo just found. I followed him down the stairs and into the tunnel leading to Rosalila. We hooked around its left side to find Ricardo working in a side door of the temple. Right inside the doorway was an area of burning with ceramics. In the middle was a pile of eccentric flints wrapped in what looked like blue and green colored cheesecloth. Eccentric flints are common in the Maya world. They're pieces of art napped in chert or obsidian. Instead of projectile points or knives, they're chipped into special shapes. Things like stars or hooks or scorpions, all sorts of stuff. But these were among the most elaborate and beautiful ever found, still to this day. In total, there were nine, each about a foot long. They were shaped like trees with branches that terminated in human faces wearing elaborate bird headdresses. Ricardo was just carefully removing them as Nasty and I arrived. He kindly moved to the side for a moment and let me take a closer look. Over my shoulder, I could hear him saying to Nasty, What is wrong with you? Don't bring students down here. But it was too late. I saw it. Now there are entire books devoted to those flints. In fact, I'll put a link to Guernsey and Riley's 2016 publication about them because it has great photos. By the next morning, they had been moved to the lab and all the field school students were invited to see them. Since I had already seen them, I was instead looking at what else had been found there. I heard that bones had been found, so I went into the osteology lab. Rebecca Story of the University of Houston was in charge there. Clearly ecstatic, she showed me the remains of a five-foot-long shark that was found just behind the flints, a little further into the building. Copan is 80 miles from the closest coast. Someone hauled a five-foot-long shark to be part of Rosalila's termination ritual. I've never found that mentioned in any publication, but I know what I saw and what I heard that day. We had a huge party at the Tunkul that night, Ricardo was the man of the hour. Spirits were so high that you'd think we had just won the Super Bowl. One project member got really drunk and needed to be helped home, but no one would do it. Not because they didn't care, but because they were scared of him. They thought he would attack them if they tried to make him leave the bar. I'm not a good fighter, but I can take a punch better than most people, so I volunteered to help his girlfriend Julia drag him home. For the record... He did not hit me. It wasn't until years later that I realized who that guy was. It was Alfonso Morales. I ended up working with him in Palenque and becoming good friends. Karma's a strange beast, isn't it? Three days later, National Geographic came to document the find. 
they made a video in the tunnels with Ricardo reenacting as if he had just found it. I saw that video a few years later and was surprised to see Ricardo shed some tears as he explained the find. I was there at the actual, real moment, and he didn't cry. He just bawled out nasty. Anyhow, the field school was wrapping up, and just in time for many of the students. Something had gotten to them, some tropical illness, and everyone except me had spent a few days in bed with high fevers. I joked that all my time in Tunkul had protected me. I called it vitamin cerveza. One of the final mornings, while walking to the ruins from town, I saw a horrible scene. A bus had crashed on the terrible road from the Guatemalan border. It fell off a cliff. There was a Red Cross office right at the bridge crossing the Copan River. Pickup trucks were bringing bodies in and laying them on its front yard. There was no one for doctors to save. They were all dead. I don't think I'll ever unsee that. The field school was finally over. Eleven students headed immediately back to the airport in San Pedro Sula. But not me. I didn't want my adventure to end. So I gave up my return flight home. One of Sheely's grad students, Rex Kuntz, was headed by bus to Antigua, Guatemala to attend a Spanish language school. I asked him if I could tag along and he said sure. He had fun repeatedly referring to us as two intrepid dudes heading into the unknown. For me, that was especially true. I honestly didn't have a plan beyond eventually flying out of Belize when my money ran out. The next two weeks were some of the weirdest adventures I ever had in Central America. But you already know what I'm going to say. That is a story for another podcast episode. So until then, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, recorded, and voiced by me, Ed Barnhart. If you like what you heard, please like, share, comment, and do all that other stuff I'm supposed to ask you to do. And if you really liked it, consider supporting Archeo Ed through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Archeo Ed. I'm in there somewhere. I make these podcasts for free, but I'm not opposed to making money. In fact, if you folks could free me from my day job, well, I'd be much obliged. ArcheoEd is my intellectual property, all rights reserved, copyright 2023.